Well, it is so great to be here this morning, and uh, today we are starting our new series for the holidays, The Lyrics of Christmas. And let me tell you, there are so many great things about Christmas time, but who just loves Christmas music, right? As long as you play it after Thanksgiving. Um, but uh, Christmas is such a wonderful time of year and such, such a fun time of year. There's so many great things that go on at Christmas time. And one of the amazing things is, of course, Christmas music. And so we're going to be in this new series uh, throughout the Christmas season called The Lyrics of Christmas. And every week, just like we did uh, just a second ago, we're going to feature a song that's going to introduce to us one of the themes of what we call Ad. Advent. Now, churches around the world, uh, Christian churches around the world, celebrate at this time of year what is called Advent. If you've never heard of Advent, basically what it is is Advent is the preparation and anticipation of the coming of Jesus at Christmas time that we celebrate at Christmas. And Advent traditionally comes with a number of different themes that you celebrate each week. And so this week, uh, our, our Lyrics of Christmas uh, series starts off with this song, When Hope Came Down, to introduce the first theme of Advent, the first theme of our Christmas series, which is hope. And so if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Isaiah chapter 9 and starting in verse 2, and we're going to read today about hope. But as you're turning there, I couldn't help but think this week as I was preparing uh, for this sermon and for this message on hope, and we're entering into this time of year, my mind went to C.S. Lewis and The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Anybody read that book or seen that movie? All right, now if you're like me, you probably watched the movie first before you read the book, but, um, but uh, what a great story that is. And C.S. Lewis was this amazing author. Um, he, he wrote a lot of great fantasy, nonfiction books, uh, fantasy fiction books, and also nonfiction books. A great Christian thinker. But uh, this story, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, if you've, if you've never heard of it, is basically about this family of kids during World War II in England. And uh, they, they are in London, and, and because of this, because of the war, they get moved into the country with this man that they've never met before so that they can be safe away from the war. And so these four siblings uh, end up in this man's house. They've never met him before. They haven't been here before, but they're in the country away from the war so that they can be safe. And one of the first things that they do when they get to this man's house is they decide that they're going to go explore all the different places that they can in the house because it's new to them. And uh, this guy apparently has a big house. And so they explore all these different rooms and they find books and furniture and all kinds of cool things. And in their exploration, they open a door and in one of the rooms, they see this giant wardrobe and really nothing else is in there. And they think, well, that's odd. And so most of the kids just move on. But the youngest, whose name is Lucy, says, well, I should go check out and see what's in that wardrobe. And so long story short, she goes, looks in the wardrobe, and, and she finds out as she steps into the wardrobe to look at what's in there, she ends up, as she walks to the back of the wardrobe, or what she thinks is the back of the wardrobe, she ends up in this magical land called Narnia in this place that she wasn't expecting to be there as she was just trying to get to the back of the wardrobe, she ends up in this place called Narnia. And uh, not knowing exactly where she is or what's going on, one of her first interactions when she gets to Narnia is with uh, a fawn, what she calls a fawn, which is basically this creature that's half goat, half human. And, and so she finds this fawn who introduces himself as Mr. Tumnus. And Mr. Tumnus and, and Lucy have a conversation they start talking and she's asking questions. Where am I? What's going on here? And as they're having this conversation, it's winter in Narnia. Now where she had just left in London, it wasn't winter, but it's winter in Narnia. And so they're having this conversation out in the snow in the cold of a forest. And Mr. Tumnus invites her to come to her house or to his house to have some tea. And so they, they go to, to, to his house to have some tea and, and not to give away too much of the story or retell the entire thing. But while she's having tea with Mr. Tumnus, Lucy learns some things about Narnia. She learns that Narnia has been under a curse of this wicked white witch who's put Narnia in this perpetual winter for so long. 
You see, as as she interacts with Mr. Tumnus, Mr. Tumnus talks about this winter multiple times and the bitter cold and the, the difficulty and the hardship of winter that they've been going through. And they have, they have this winter that's going on for this long time. And while Narnia seems like this great and magical place, it's, it's actually been facing a lot of da- darkness and hardship because of the oppression of this wicked white witch who, is, who has imposed this perpetual winter on the people. And one of the statements that Mr. Tumnus makes when he's talking to Lucy is he says these words. He says, it, it, talking about Narnia, he says, in Narnia, It's always winter, but never Christmas. Have you ever felt that way in your life before? You face situations or circumstances. You you come to moments in life where where things are not going the way they're supposed to go, where where life is difficult, where it seems like everything is dark and cold and and icy and snowy and there's just nothing good going on. And, And in the midst of the hardship, in the midst of the darkness, it seems like it's always winter and never Christmas. You see, winter can be a dark and difficult time, but we celebrate Christmas in the middle of winter, which brings joy and happiness and light and life. But has your life ever felt like it's always winter, never Christmas? Are there moments or times in your life, I'm, I'm sure if each one of us were to stop and think about it, we could think of times or moments that we've been through seasons of our lives where it feels like it's always winter, Never Christmas. Maybe you're in one of those seasons right now. And as we think about this theme of hope, what we have to recognize is that for some of us, right now in our lives, we're facing a situation or a circumstance where we don't necessarily feel like there is a lot of hope. For some of you, maybe you've faced those situations or circumstances in your life in the past. But what we celebrate at Advent, what we celebrate at Christmas, is the coming of hope. And what we see as we turn to Isaiah chapter 9 is that in the midst of the world's brokenness, hope came down in Jesus. In the midst of the world's darkness and difficulty and hardship and and the the cold and separation that, that can seem to happen in this world, hope came down in Jesus. Hope came down in Jesus. The Israelites, the people of God in Isaiah chapter 9, are facing one of those times or seasons of always winter but never Christmas in their life. You see, Israel, the people of God, had had been ruled by some great kings, people like David and Solomon, who had built up Israel to be this great, this great nation. But really what was behind Israel's greatness was not the fact that they had good rulers, but was the fact that they served a great God. They served the God of the universe. And yet over time the Israelites turn away from God. They start to walk away from him. They they start to be led by rulers who who don't serve God, who don't love God, who don't lead the people to love God, and the people walk away from God too. And Israel is finding themselves in Isaiah chapter 9 in a place where they're facing darkness and difficulty and hardship because of the fact that they have chosen not to serve God. Israel right now is, is, is in a place where they're in the midst of war, they're in the midst of, of difficulties, they've been attacked by multiple nations, and everywhere they've tried to turn for help has failed them. They've tried to make alliances with stronger nations, but all of these wars have led to death and destruction of their homeland, of the places and the people that they love. And, and in Israel, they... they, they are facing more and more darkness. And so in desperation, they reach out in all these different places to find help, but they don't turn to God. And Israel is conquered by this nation called Assyria and the Assyrians come in and they destroy so much of Israel. And not only do they destroy these people, they kill so many of them, but they take them and they remove them from their homeland and they take them back to Assyria where they will have to be forced to learn the ways of the Assyrian people, the people who have killed their people, the people who have destroyed their homeland. They're in a time of darkness where it could seem like it's always winter, 
never Christmas. They're in a time of hopelessness. And right in the midst of this season, God sends a prophet by the name of Isaiah to speak a message to these people. Isaiah is a man of God who loves God, who serves God, and and God gives him a message to speak to these Israelites who are facing this darkness, who are facing the death of loved ones, the destruction of war that has ravaged their country for so long without without any reprieve, without any rest from it. And in Isaiah chapter 9, and starting in verse 2, we hear the message that God wants to speak to the people of Israel through the prophet Isaiah. Starting in verse 2, he says this, The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who dwelt in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shone. Now if there were ever a nation of people that could identify with this reality of walking in darkness, of being in a place of darkness and hopelessness, it would be the Israelites. Everything that they'd ever hoped for, everything that they trusted in to try to to help them in this time had failed them, and now all they have ahead of them is destruction. All they have ahead of them is is being taken to a place that they don't want to go and being forced to, to assimilate to a group of people that they hate. Because they've conquered them, they've killed their loved ones, they've destroyed their homeland. And Isaiah speaks to these people, God rather speaks to these people through Isaiah and says these people who are walking in darkness, they're dwelling in the midst of deep darkness. Isaiah and God through Isaiah recognizes the darkness of the moment they're in. But God says there's going to be a change coming. Those who walked in darkness have seen Light. Those who who dwelt in a land of deep, deep darkness, on them light has shone. Not a light that they sought out, not a light that they did anything to make happen, but a light that God shines on them because of his love and his grace and his mercy for them. You see, we may not live in the nation of Israel thousands of years ago facing exile by the Assyrians. But the world we live in is filled with darkness and brokenness and and difficulty. And the reason for that is because of sin. The reason for that is sin. You see, ever since the, the beginning, the creation of mankind, the creation of the world, God created this world so that so that those who are in it and everything that was created in it could glorify and honor him, could, could point to him, could, could experience all the great things that God would have for them. But because of mankind's choice, through Adam and Eve and every single person since then, instead of turning to God, the one who created them, the one who loved them, the one who, who made them with a purpose, instead of turning to God, they turned away from God. Mankind walked in its own way. And oftentimes you think of sin, we think of of things that people do that that aren't what God would want for them to do. And certainly sin is included, or that's included in sin, but sin is so much more than that because sin went so much deeper than somebody choosing to do something that God wouldn't like. In fact, sin went so deep that it was at the very core of every person. There was this disposition, this idea, this, this, this basic understanding that, that while God may be out there, I don't want him running my life. I'm going to do it my own way. And sin infected the human race and plunged all of creation into darkness and into difficulty and into hardship and all of the disease and the, the, the brokenness of the world that we live in is a result of sin is a result of sin in the world. You see, the world is full of darkness and brokenness because of sin. Now that doesn't mean that every every bad thing that happens to you or somebody you love is because they did something to deserve it. What it means is that the entire system of the world has has been corrupted by sin and because we live in a sinful world, sinful things happen. And in the midst of deep darkness, we may not be in in Israel facing Assyrian exile, but 
But in the midst of the deep darkness of a world filled with sin, Isaiah's words to the Israelites speak to us today that to a people who walked in darkness, God wants to bring light. That in your life, when you face those times and seasons of always winter, never Christmas, of darkness and cold and separation and isolation and anxiety and depression and all the, all the brokenness and difficulty that comes with the things of this world that leave you sensing hopelessness, Christmas and Advent is about the fact that light is coming. And this light isn't, isn't a light that's, that's just, well, just stay positive and things will get better. This light isn't drummed up from within us. This light is given to us as a gift from God. This light is hope that we can have that the God of the universe loved us enough to do something about our brokenness. You see, while the world is full of darkness and brokenness and sin and all of these bad things, God who created us and the God who we turned away from loved us enough to do something about it, to do everything that he could to turn us back, to offer us a way back to the way th that things were supposed to be. In the midst of deep darkness, a light has shone. Now, I don't know what darkness you might be facing in your life, what difficulty you've had in your past, the situations or circumstances that have come into your life because of maybe your choices or maybe outside of your choices, things that have just happened to you that you never had anything to do with, you never would have chosen, and you never wanted for yourself, but they happened to you anyway. Here's what I want to say to you today, that in the midst of deep darkness, there's hope. There's hope. This is what Advent's all about. This is what Christmas is all about. That in a world that was plunged into darkness, there was light that God offered. What does this light do for us? Isaiah continues on in verse three. He says, you have multiplied the nation. You have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as they are glad when they divide the spoil. For the yoke of his burden and the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken as on the day of Midian. For every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for fire. Here's what Isaiah says. To people facing darkness and difficulty and hopelessness, God brings light. God brings hope. And what's that hope? Verse three, he says, you've multiplied the nation. This nation has been going through war. This nation has, been, has seen many people killed off in war and they're being taken away from their homeland. And what is God's promise? He says, you're gonna multiply this nation. He's gonna increase it. He's gonna increase this nation that's been cut down by all these places and all these wars that have come against them. God is gonna multiply them and increase them. They're gonna rejoice with what kind of joy? Not a fake joy, not a, not a little joy, but the kind of joy that comes when they've had the best harvest that they've ever had and they bring it in and everything is good and everything is right with the world. The kind of joy that comes when they've been attacked by their enemy and they conquered them and they bring home the spoils of war. That that's the kind of overflowing, exciting joy that God wants to bring them. That might seem like a, a far shot away from where they are, facing exile in Assyria. But Isaiah says God wants to bring them that joy. Verse four, he says, for the yoke of his burden and the staff for his oppressor, the, or the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor, you have broken on the day, as on the day of Midian. What, what these images are, this, this yoke, this staff, this rod of the oppressor is this idea that the Israelites are under the burden of oppression. They're being enslaved by the, the Assyrians. They're, they're being put in a position where they don't have any freedom. And what does Isaiah say God wants to do? He says he wants to break the rod, break the yoke, break the staff of the oppressor as on the day of Midian. Now what in the world is Midian? Midian to the Israelites is a picture back to one of God's great deliverances of his people. Back in the days of the judges in the book of Judges in your Bible, 
we read about a man named Gideon. And Gideon, the least, of, the least tribe in all of Israel, the least of his family, gets called by God to lead an army against the Midianites who are oppressing God's people. And Gideon says, I'm nothing, I can't do this, but God calls him anyways. And so Gideon assembles this huge army of thousands of thousands of people and God says, you know what, it's great that you're doing this, you've got too many people, you need to get rid of some of them. And so the army dwindles down and and, and they have very few, a lot less people and, and God says to him again, your army's still too big, Gideon. And Gideon's thinking, we're going to be going up against the Midianites, these these enemies of ours who have this huge army. They're well-trained. They've destroyed us. And you want me to go in with a smaller army? Doesn't sound very smart. But God dwindles Gideon's army down to 300 people. And then God tells Gideon to go and surround the enemy's camp, surround the Midianite camp with a torch and some horns. Doesn't sound like the best battle plan to me. And they break their their torch, they blow their horns, and what happens is God brings a great deliverance without the Gideon or his army even having to fight anybody. Because God throws the Midianite army into confusion and they all fight each other and kill each other. And then they run off and the Israelites chase them down. God brings a great deliverance to his people through Gideon against the Midianites. And this is what Isaiah is referencing when he says this. He says, for the yoke of his burden, the Israelites under the Midianites were under the yoke of slavery. The the staff for his shoulder, the rod of his oppressor. He says, God is going to break that rod, that staff, that yoke of burden as he did for Gideon and for the Israelites. And how did that happen? It didn't happen because of something that the Israelites or Gideon in his military knowledge was able to make happen. It happened because God God worked. So what he says is not only in verse three does he want to bring them joy, but God wants to bring them freedom. While they're facing oppression, while they're facing darkness and difficulty, God wants to bring them freedom. Verse five, Isaiah says, for every boot of the tramping warrior in battle tumult and every garment rolled in blood will be burned as fuel for fire. In other words, what Isaiah is saying is all the battle gear is not going to be necessary anymore when God does what he wants to do. You can burn it all because you're not going to need it. Instead of of being conquered, God wants to bring them victory. This is what Isaiah speaks to the Israelite people. And what we know historically is, is that Israel does come back to, the Israelites do come back to their promised land, to Israel. That Israel does see in some ways a fulfillment of what Isaiah is talking about. But what we know is that Isaiah being a prophet was not just speaking to the Israelites of that day, but Isaiah had a word that was bigger than dealing with the Israelites thousands of years ago and Assyrians and all of those things. That what God wanted to speak through Isaiah was bigger than that time or than that situation. That God God wanted to say to all of his people, the oppression, the darkness, the difficulty that they would face because of the battle of sin against them, because of the spiritual battle that's waged against them on behalf of their souls that that Satan would want to bring everybody down, that God says to them, he's shining light and hope in the midst of of a world ravaged by sin. He's offering a lifeline. And if you take that lifeline, he wants to offer you the same thing that he offered the Israelites. You see, God can give you joy, freedom, and victory over the oppression of sin. Just like Isaiah speaks of the joy that they can have at harvest, of the freedom they can have when God breaks the yoke of their oppressor, of the victory that they'll have when they don't even need their war implements anymore, they can just burn them all. God wants to do the same thing in your life. He wants to do the same thing in my life. As we face the darkness and the hardship and the difficulty of sin in this world, of the things that happen because of brokenness and sin and darkness, the light that that God wants to shine is a light that is intended to bring you joy, a light that's intended to bring you freedom, a light that's intended to bring you victory. 
So how do we, how do we gain that promise? How do we get what Jesus, or what, what Isaiah is saying to us in this moment? Isaiah continues on in verse seven, or six. Probably one of the most well-known passages of scripture when it comes to Christmas time. He says, for to us, a child is born. To us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and of peace there will be no end. And on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and to uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time forth forevermore, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. What Isaiah says is this, there's coming hope. There's coming hope from all the darkness and the difficulty you're facing and that hope is coming in the form of a child. Now for the Israelites in this day, they're probably thinking that there's gonna be born to them some human person who's gonna rise up to be a king and conquer the Assyrians and restore them to their former greatness. And as I said, the Israelites do return to Israel. They do see in some ways a fulfillment of this. But we know that Isaiah is looking beyond the the current situation to a greater future that God has for all of his people. And how do we know that? Because of how he describes this victory, how he describes the fulfillment of this promise coming. It's coming through a child. It's coming through a son. And what's going to happen to this son? The government, the ruling is going to be on him, not on us anymore, not on humanity anymore. And what's going to happen? What's he going to be like? How is he going to rule? He's going to be a wonderful counselor. He's going to be a mighty God. He's going to be an everlasting father. He's going to be the prince of peace. These descriptions of this child are descriptions of what his rule and his reign is supposed to be like. Wonderful counselor. He's he's going to be one that has all wisdom of God and knows how to lead people in the way that they need to go. Mighty God, there will be none that can stand up against him. None that could threaten his power, his reign, or his rule. Everlasting Father, this one gets confusing for people sometimes because they think, well, Jesus is the Son of God. He's not God the Father, so why are they calling him Everlasting Father? What, what this picture of Everlasting Father is, is that Jesus will reign with the love and the care and the concern of a father not of some disinterested or or separated king who doesn't really care about the people out there. Rather, he will rule as a king who cares and loves and has concern for each person in his kingdom. Prince of peace. That the darkness and the, the difficulties, the spiritual war that has been waged is going to be won by him and there will be freedom and peace from it. This is the child that is the fulfillment of this promise. And while Israel may have had some rising and falling of kings in its history, when Jesus came, this promise started to be fulfilled. You see, in the darkness of life, God offers hope. And he offers hope in maybe one of the most unlikely places, in a child born in a manger in a small town in the backwoods of nowhere. And he offers hope through this young child who grows up in the home of a carpenter, who's not high class society, who, who, who grows up in this home and, and explodes onto the scene when he's about 30 years old and teaches people about the kingdom of God and does miracles and and sees all of these great things and people start to hope, they start to wonder, is this the one, is this the one that's gonna finally strike down and conquer the Romans and restore us to a great earthly kingdom? But God's plan was so much greater than a great earthly kingdom because Jesus went to the cross and he died and with him the hopes of many people died because they thought that he was supposed to be the kind of king that he was never intended to be in that time 
Gomer in that moment because God's hope was not to cover to conquer an earthly ent- entity, but God's hope was to conquer sin that went deeper in everything. And by Jesus' perfect life and his death, he conquers sin when he raises again from the dead. And he rules as this ruler that we read about in Isaiah. He rules as wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. You see, through Jesus, you can experience the fulfillment of all of God's promises. Through Jesus, you can experience the fulfillment of all of God's promises. Now, now as I say this, you might say, that sounds great. All of that sounds really good. I want in on that, but there's a problem because as I live on this earth, as I've, as I've walked through life and as I've tried to follow Jesus, I still face hardships. I still face difficulty. Freedom and victory are not always mine. I don't always see joy. I don't always know the way to go. So what kind of ruler is this child because I'm still still going through it, and sin is still affecting me in this world. Well, let me tell you something. This ruler, Jesus, who conquered the grave and conquered sin that you can give yourself to in this life, right now in this moment, that you can follow him, he wants to make a difference in your life here and now. He wants to give you freedom from addiction, freedom from difficulty and hardship in your life. He wants to give you joy when there's no reason to have joy. He wants to give you uh, victory over the spiritual battles that are waged in your life. He wants to do that here and in this world. But his kingdom, though it's already here, is not yet here in its fullness because this Jesus is coming back again. And he is going to come and he is going to rule as the the perfect fulfillment of what we've just read. He's going to rule as a king that his, the government is on his shoulders, that the increase of his government uh, will be peace, that there's going to be no end to his rule, that he's going to be on the throne of David and over his kingdom. What does that mean? Way back in the Old Testament, God promises the king David that his throne will rule for all of eternity. And it could seem like, well, that promise got, got pushed by the wayside. God didn't fulfill that one. But what, what we see in Jesus is that Jesus, a descendant of David, will be the fulfillment of that rule over the throne of David, over all of creation, that he is going to rule and establish and uphold God's kingdom with justice and with righteousness from this time forth and forevermore. While the kingdom of God is here now, it's not here yet in its fullness, but Jesus is coming again. And how can we know? How can we trust? How can we, in the, in the midst of hopelessness that we face in this life, how can we trust that it's all going to work out? Isaiah throws this on the end. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. In other words, God is fully committed to making this happen. He's got no doubts in his mind. He's got no other directions he's considering. God is fully committed to making this happen. So you put yourself in line with him and you're gonna see this happen. You're gonna see his kingdom come in your life. You're gonna see his will be done in your life while you're here on this earth. And someday in the future when Jesus comes back again, you're going to rule and reign with him as conquerors because of what Jesus has done for you. Jesus came to bring us this freedom. You see, in this life, we face situations and circumstances, times and moments when things don't go exactly like we planned them to go, when it can seem hard to have hope. Let me tell you today that if you're here and you're looking at your life, you're, you're thinking about where you're at spiritually, and you would say, I'm not really a follower of Jesus, that Jesus can bring that freedom, Jesus can bring that joy, Jesus can bring that victory to your life now. 
He can bring it to you today, that today you can look to this baby that was in a manger that rose, uh, that grew up to be this man, that, that there was this great man who died on a cross and went to the grave, but he didn't stay there as just some other man. He rose from the dead. You can give your life to him. You can commit yourself to following him, and he can give you joy and freedom over sin and victory over sin in your life and joy in the midst of difficulty and hardship. He can do that for you today. And as you face the difficulties of life that continue to come, you can have hope that he will do it in its fullness when he comes again. So I'm going to invite everybody this morning to bow your heads and close your eyes. And as we think of this idea of hope, Here's what we need to get in our hearts and in our minds. That when you are looking for hope, you need to reach out to Jesus. When you're looking for hope, you need to reach out to Jesus. Because only in Jesus is there a well-founded hope that you can bank on. Only in Jesus is there a hope that you can trust in fully. So this morning... As you look at your life, what does your connection, relationship with Jesus look like? What hopelessness are you facing? And have you turned to Jesus to be the answer? This morning, if you've never done that before, if you've never turned to Jesus and trusted in him and committed to following him in your life so that you can have the joy and the freedom and the victory that he wants to bring to you, today can be your day to do that. And maybe you've done this in the past. Maybe there was a time in, the, in, in years ago when you made that commitment, but it didn't seem like anything really happened from it, and, and it didn't seem like life went the way you thought it would, and, and so you kind of walked away from that commitment. Today can be a day where you can make that commitment again, and you can look forward and hope to the ultimate fulfillment of what God wants to do. So I want to ask you this morning to think about your life and your relationship with Jesus. Who is Jesus to you? He can bring hope in the most hopeless situation. He can bring change and transformation to your life. This morning, will you give your life to him? This morning, will you trust in him? And if that's you this morning, if you're saying, I want to do that, I want to give myself to Jesus, I want to give my life over to him, here's what I want to ask you to do. I want to just ask you to raise your hand, not because I want to embarrass you or call you out or anything like that. I'm not going to do anything like that. I simply want to know who you are so I can pray with you. I see hands back here. Anybody else who says, I need the hope of Jesus, hands over here. Anyone else, hands over here. You say, I need the hope of Jesus. I need to give my life to him. I need to trust in him. And I need to invite him into my life and commit myself to following him. Anyone else? Hands back there. You can put your hands down. Lord Jesus, I thank you for each one who just raised their hand. I thank you for the work that you're doing in their life to bring them to a place where they want to trust in you. They want to put their hope in you because only in you is hope well grounded. So Jesus, I pray for them. I pray that today, whatever difficulties, hardships, whatever darkness they're facing in their life, I pray they would lay it down to you and they would commit themselves to you. Here's what I'm going to ask you to do. Will everybody here this morning with heads bowed and eyes closed, please repeat this prayer with me. This isn't a magic prayer. It's not magic words or anything like that. This is simply a way for you to express to God, for those of you who raised your hands, that I'm giving my life to you and I want to follow you and I want you to be the leader of my life so I can have the hope that you have to offer. So would you repeat this prayer after me? Dear Jesus, thank you for all you've done for me. Thank you for coming as a baby. Thank you for living a perfect life. Thank you for dying on the cross for taking the penalty that I deserved. Lord, I give myself to you. 
forgive me of my sins, cleanse me, make me new, transform me into a new person. And now I commit my life to you. I want to follow you from this day forward. Change my heart, make me new. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen. For those of you who just prayed that prayer, you raised your hand, you said, that's me, I, I want to pray that prayer. Let me tell you this morning that heaven is rejoicing and that I'm rejoicing with you because the hope of Jesus is now yours. And for the rest of you who would say, I'm already following Jesus, here's what I want to say to you. The same hope is available. That when life isn't perfect, it's not the way that it's supposed to be that God wants to offer hope to you and that that hope is ultimately fulfilled in Jesus. So I'm going to ask Joel and our worship team to close us in a song here. And as they do, what I want you to think about is the hope of Jesus that came down for us. This Jesus that was the fulfillment of Isaiah's prophecy and his promise. This Jesus that can offer hope to us and while that hope is already available to us as followers of Jesus, it's not yet here in its fullness. And one day he will come again. And one day we will see the perfect fulfillment of that hope. And one day we will be in a place and a time where there's no weeping, no hurt, no shame, no darkness, because we are in the very presence of God unhindered by sin. So as our worship team leads us in this song to close us out, I want you to think on that. I want you to pray about that. And then I want to ask you as you go today to go carrying the hope of Jesus.